Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team at this company called Weaveworks. Uh, we're running this workshop now that will be um, bracketed for two hours. We usually finish in around 30 minutes. Uh, but the goal here is to give you sort of an intro to Kubernetes, especially in the context of how GitOps is uh, very much an evolution as part of the growth of Kubernetes. So we'll have um, sort of talks around that. Uh, if you've come to any of our recent events, um, we had a GitOps one-stop shop event where it was great to see um, Kubernetes co-creator Brendan Burns sort of reiterate that idea of how GitOps is um, really kind of a, an evolution of the capabilities of Kubernetes. So it's very exciting. Um, so we're really lucky that we have um, Mark Emice, our principal engineer, who will be giving that talk. Um, and then after that, I'll sort of give an overview of sort of the goals. And then we have uh, David Stelfer, who's one of our uh, product managers, who will be walking you through the steps. So hopefully you're here for that. And thanks for joining. Uh, so with that, we'll give a little bit of a background. Uh, if you are new to us, welcome. Uh, this is a part of our various GitOps events. Uh, sometimes there are Weave user group events. Uh, as you can see, we all work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, and if you're new, uh, you can check out our website, weave.works. We have various products and open source projects, um, a core of which is um, Flux and Flagger, which are both in the CNCF. We also have Cortex, which is in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and they're really kind of the technologies that have become the core of this concept of GitOps and has led us to um, coin that term, um, uh, which uh, kind of gives you those capabilities of um, being able to have uh, GitOps, uh, sorry, uh, and Git repo as a single source of truth, um, an extension of that flagger, um, uses those capabilities, gets Prometheus metrics, and is able to do things like Canary deployments based on those metrics. So these are all the things that, um, you know, and many, many more that have come out of our company. And now today you'll be able to see sort of the open source bits of what we call Weave GitOps, a kind of an opinionated way to get started with GitOps that hopefully we find that you'll find very useful. And so um, the thing that I mentioned was an event we did on October 20th, and it was called our GitOps One Stop Shop event. And what's been really exciting, and you can now see the videos, is that the core project um, Flux that is in the CNCF um, is being used by Amazon, D2IQ, Microsoft, Red Hat, VMware, uh, and by us through Weave GitOps. Um, so it's really been uh, gratifying to see its evolution. Um, we're uh, an incubating project and we're very, very close to graduating. And so uh, all to say, you know, this is a core technology that is um, really kind of proven itself. And currently we went through a security audit as part of our graduation process. And so it's been very gratifying to see just the strength of our architecture and our engineering. And that's why these major companies um, trust in Flux and we ourselves are building our product. Um, we've GitOps on it. So hopefully it'll be useful for you as well to get started with that. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll have us three speakers. Uh, hopefully by now Zoom is fairly, uh, you know, well used. And so you'll know to make sure to ask your questions to uh, in the chat uh, and make sure that it's selected to all panels and attendees, because a lot of times people will answer each other's questions. And so uh, make sure that you can post it to everyone so they can uh, see your questions and they can help you out. Um, Alternatively, if you have something that's really, really private, then of course you can uh, just set it to our, our panelists. Uh, and like I said, uh, we plan for these for about two hours, but usually we wrap up in about 90 minutes. And so, yes, I think with that, this is kind of our general agenda. Like I said, we'll go through the intro and uh, then we'll go through the Weave GitOps overview and then getting started steps. And so we'll definitely be sharing these links with you. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Mark Emice, who will give the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps talk. Thanks and so Mark, do you like your questions uh, throughout or at the end? What's your preference? Uh, probably questions throughout. That way we're, we're talking about the particular slide or the concept that uh, people can ask questions about. Okay, great. So I'll be monitoring the chat. So if anybody has questions, just let us know and I'll... Uh, alert uh, mark of that so thanks uh thank you 
Thanks, Demo. Uh, so as Demo mentioned, I'm going to give a, a really high level and brief overview of what Kubernetes is and how it relates uh, to uh, also some overview of GitOps and how the two of them uh, relate together. So one thing I have noticed giving these presentations on Zoom, uh, sometimes I tend to talk I get to talking pretty fast because I don't get to see any of the audience uh, and 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 get that feedback that I'm talking too fast. So if you find me talking too fast, then you know just post something on on the chat or whatever, and uh, either Stacy or Tamil or David will ping me and tell me, "Hey, slow down." Uh, so with that, let's get started. So I'm Mark Emice, uh, principal engineer on the Weave GitOps product. Uh, I have been uh, in the software industry for 30, 30 plus years at this point, and the last five have all focused primarily on containers and Kubernetes itself. If you need to reach me, you can get me on Twitter at, at Mark Emice, on GitHub, Pale Mountain Rider, or uh, mark.emice at weave.works. And if you join our Weave Kubernetes user Slack, uh, which is where we do have a channel that is specific to Weave GitOps, you can ask questions and, and get input from uh, not only me, but other developers and, and people like David, uh, then uh, on that uh, uh, Slack, I'm known as Mark, Mark E. So what am I going to cover today? I'm going to go over an introduction on Kubernetes itself, and I'm going to talk about uh, and then dovetail into GitOps. But so what do I, when I'm talking about uh, kind of Kubernetes, what is it? It's basically a, a clustering system for containers. So containers are a way to package up your software uh, in a way that it's uh, repeatable and immutable and can be run uh, on different environments using an, uh, a system that can run it. So Kubernetes is going to run those containers uh, in what we like to say the modern ops stack for the cloud, uh, because you're going to build these containers and that may, gives you somewhat portability across the different environments you can run them on. Uh, and Kubernetes is the common uh, platform that can run those containers. So I like to kind of talk about them as clusters of containers in that area. Uh, Kubernetes itself is really a core API uh, that you're gonna interact with. Uh, and inside that core API are things like namespaces that allow you to segregate your uh, workloads uh, and things that are inside the Kubernetes platform that are running. Uh, then there's pods. Pods are the base building block of Kubernetes. So we talk a lot about containers, uh, but a pod is the lowest uh, instance or uh, lowest primitive that Kubernetes makes available to you. And that can have one or more pods inside of it. Uh, then there's services that allow you to interact with your uh, the pods that you deploy in your system. Uh, and there's other things, events, there's secrets, there's configuration, uh, there's kind of an apps concept, there's storage. So how do I you know, use persistent storage when working with Kubernetes? Uh, do, can I do jobs? Can I do cron jobs? Uh, what about security and certificates and networking and RBAC? So when you're building a distributed application, these are all things that you have to think about uh, and you need uh, inside of your environment to run a, run and you know operate a distributed application. Kubernetes is the thing that's providing that whole platform for you. So it's a fairly complicated uh, piece of software here that you're gonna leverage. Um, in addition to all the things that are built into Kubernetes, you can extend Kubernetes with something called uh, cluster resource definitions, CRDs. Uh, each CRD is gonna have a controller that uh, drives that and is responsible for the life cycle of uh, uh, the references or the individual objects that you that match your cluster resources. Um, so there's also a concept of operators. Operators have the ability to kind of reach outside of the Kubernetes environment, and that's kind of the line that kind of distinguishes between whether something the controller or an operator. Um, again, these are high level concepts that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but just giving you a brief introduction on kind of the distributed platform that is Kubernetes itself. Now, when we talk about uh, GitOps, well, we need something to manage all of that complexity that we just talked about. So namespaces, pod services, uh, my CRDs, my controllers, et cetera. How are we gonna manage all of that complexity uh, for this new environment that we're gonna be interacting with? Um, we, want, uh, we want something that is a cloud native best practices uh, for Kubernetes because all the applications and workloads that you're going to build and run on Kubernetes are gonna be cloud native based. So when we talk about GitOps, uh, we want something that mirrors that same architecture, if you will, uh, that's going to run the pipelines that are going to do your continuous delivery. We're going to talk more about this, but that's what GitOps is bringing to the table. So uh, when, you, when you're looking at a GitOps solution, it needs to be a cloud native and needs to follow those cloud native best practices. Um, 
the title kind of gives it away some of the bits of it. So it's Git based. Uh, and what does Git really give us? So really, uh, you can talk about Git, but what we're really discussing is it needs to be version controlled and have immutable storage, which means if I can go, I need to be able to go backwards in time and reference a previous thing that I deployed. So I need that immutable storage because it's really important uh, when operating a complicated environment like this to be able to know I can get back to a previously working state if I need to. And then the ops piece, of course, is continuous delivery. So uh, a lot of people group uh, CICD together, and that's more of a push mode uh, with continuous delivery. But with the Kubernetes environment, and something I'm going to hit on a lot is kind of the declarative nature of it. Uh, we need to be more of a pull-based model. And that's what Git really provides is that pull-based model of continuous delivery and automation around all of that. So let's dig in a little bit more on Kubernetes itself. So it's an open source platform for operations. So it did come out of Google. Uh, and again, it's all about building highly scalable distributed based applications. Um, there's a control plane, the thing that manages Kubernetes itself, all of the objects and the primitives that Kubernetes has. There's an API that it's, that's exposed there that allows you to interact with the control plane and also the data plane, which is where your custom workloads uh, reside within Kubernetes itself. So we're going to interact through that API to interact with both planes uh, when we're dealing with Kubernetes itself. So um, one thing about Kubernetes is it is a standard, uh, standard, you know, definition for kind of your platform, your distributed platform. But there are variations, of course, because you can get different distributions of Kubernetes itself. Not only can you get this different distributions, but you can run them differently. So we can run them self-hosted that we're going to do in the examples today that David's going to take us through. We're going to run something called Kind, which is Kubernetes inside of Docker. So that means we're going to leverage the Docker process that's on your host, and it's going to run a full Kubernetes environment inside of that Docker environment. But then you can go all the way out to a hosted cloud environment uh, like uh, uh, Amazon EKS, for instance, to where they're going to provide you the Kubernetes environment, the control plane, they're going to manage that aspect of it, and you get to deploy your workloads into that environment. Uh, not only are there different distributions, but there are different modes of running it. So you can have dev test users uh, to where maybe persistent storage and high availability aren't crucial. Uh, so that'll dictate how big your Kubernetes cluster is, for instance, like with hey, a high availability versus like production infrastructure. Right. But you want to be assured that uh, when you develop your application, that you can run it uh, the same way across not only self-hosted and managed, but dev test clusters versus production clusters. And that's something that Kubernetes provides with this conformance testing environment. So when you're looking for a distribution, and if you use one of the well-known ones, you know, like, a, you know, from uh, Microsoft or Amazon or Google, Right, they're going to pass all the conformance tests. But if you're looking at some other product, you want to check and make sure the conformance testing is there because you don't want to accidentally build something uh, that's not going to be portable across different uh, environments. So, and again, uh, we talk about uh, you know Kubernetes being a standard thing, right, a platform, but there are differences across the different cloud providers. And a lot of that's going to come around how you attach storage, what kind of storage you can attach, uh, the networking, how you expose networking, uh, like ingress into your uh, clusters, load balancing, all those kind of aspects there. Uh, the nice thing is Kubernetes does, does provide primitives for that, that you're going to interact with inside your application. But if you're managing the control plane, there's different things that you'll need to keep uh, in mind, because that's outside of kind of the purview of Kubernetes itself. Uh, in addition to that, so Kubernetes is, is fundamentally based on something uh, called controllers that are reconciling towards a desired state. So when you interact with Kubernetes, um, you're, you're defining a manifest and, and asking for, hey, I need this desired state in my Kubernetes environment, which is a shift from more a more imperative state that you may be used to. Um, in, in, in other environments, but that declarative configuration is really a key aspect of Kubernetes and really provided kind of a, a shift in how you think about your workloads and your applications and things like that, because you're not defining a set of imperative steps to do something now, you're defining that desired state that you want out. Uh, in addition to that, you know, you're containerizing your apps. Uh, so an example here would be deployments. So you want a deployment, you have a certain number of 
instances or replicas of that deployment that you need running maybe to handle load, uh, you're going to define that as a desired state and let Kubernetes derive to that actual state by comparing that desired state versus what's actually running in the system. And it's not only up, it's also down. So if you had seven instances running and your desired state was five, Kubernetes is going to back it off uh, to get you down to that five. I'm using uh, the number of replicas or the count of one because it's the easiest one really to understand. Uh, the desired state can be a lot more complicated than that, but the replica one is a, is a, a good one to put in your head because it's easy to kind of uh, understand and reason about. So what do I mean by uh, kind of declarative versus imperative call? So if I take this command that I've got on the screen here, which is this kubectl run image. So I'm just saying, hey, I wanna run this weave GitOps image on my Kubernetes cluster. That's going to result in a pod running. Remember, I mentioned that a pod is the base building block inside of Kubernetes. That's going to create a pod, a single pod that's running a single container image inside of it. Um, that pod itself will have a life cycle. So if I tell it that I want it to be restarted or something like that on the command line, it, Kubernetes will manage that for me. But the thing now is if I needed a second instance of this uh, Weave GitOps uh, container running, I'd have to do that myself because I'm doing it imperatively with this kubectl run. So the, the pod definition itself is not really declarative. And the way I'm doing it here is an imperative call. So how's that different than a, a declarative call? So if I were to take that image, wrap it up inside of a deployment, I'm going to define something called a template spec spec for how I want that pod that is comprised of my container image to run. I'm going to define that in something called a deployment YAML file. Uh, the name it doesn't matter, but the kind that I'm using inside of Kubernetes is something called a deployment. Inside there, I'm going to specify that I want, let's say, three replicas running. So now the command that I'm going to run on Kubernetes is going to be kubectl apply dash f depth dot YAML. So notice my verb changed from run to apply and apply should signal that, hey, I'm just saying, this is what I would like to have happen. Please go and make it happen. If you need to do runs underneath the covers in order to get my number of replicas, please do that for me, right? So that's the, the key difference we get, we're gonna do with Kubernetes is to be able to do that kind of uh, declaring what state you want uh, and let Kubernetes handle that for you. So let's see. So uh, there's other options, there's other things in there. So you can do a job, you can do cron jobs. Again, these are some of the, the differences of the primitives that Kubernetes itself provides for you. So they have some kind of stateful set where if you had a database and you needed a certain number of nodes to have quorums so that you can make sure uh, you have you know, availability, you can specify that in a stateful set. And Kubernetes manages all of that for you. Right. So previously, you'd have an ops team that would have to figure out how to do this. They'd have to script everything to do that in order to ensure that we uh, get everything up and running here. Uh, and one thing we like to talk about uh, when you think about Kubernetes is kind of a control loop. So uh, Kubernetes controller, you set a desired state, the controller is going to going to going to engage and it's going to check the actual state and then it's going to say, hey, these don't match. Or if they do, it's a no op. But if they don't, I'm going to take actions in order to get to that step uh, to make sure that they, my actual and desired state uh, match. So kind of at a real high level, um, you're going to declare your desired state. You're going to tell Kubernetes, this is my desired state. Kubernetes is going to have control loops for all of the primitives that you've defined in your desired state and drive towards meeting the desired state that you need, right? And Kubernetes is going to handle all of that automatically for you. So now when you're building a distributed application with multiple instances, with services in order to talk to them in a, and maybe a shared database and a Redis cache or whatever, all of that is just I'm declaring I need these things running and I need this kind of connectivity. Kubernetes is the thing that builds all those pieces and ensures they're all running there together. So with that is a kind of what Kubernetes is doing under the covers. And again, this is intentionally at a very high level. Uh, let's talk about what GitOps brings to the table when it comes to that. So I talk about, you know, if you had a very complicated application and you're trying to manage all of that state, what would it look like um, kind of if we could have that all represented as a single artifact. So remember before I talked about, I needed a version and I needed an immutable state. So if I, have, if I have these artifacts spread all over, it's really hard to have that single picture of what things uh, look like or what my expectations are. 
enter did ops, this is where that git commit represents exactly what you expect to have happen. So this is why Git is so powerful here uh, with that version and immutable aspect. I can always go to a particular commit in Git and get exactly the set of manifests that I want. So now instead of doing the kubectl apply of my manifest, I'm gonna pull those out of Kubernetes, out of Git and apply them that way. And hint, hint, we're gonna use GitOps to apply them uh, automatically for us. So we're not interacting with the com command line directly. And uh, we'll talk about benefits to that. So, but really GitOps is more than that. And when I say more than that, so it's not just Weaveworks that are thinking about this problem here of kind of the pull based and the GitOps model. Uh, there's a open consortium that has been working on what does it mean to be GitOps? And so if you go to the open GitOps.dev uh, organization, uh, they've defined these kind of four principles here. These should look familiar, right? So it's a declarative environment, which means you're not setting up a bunch of steps that you need captured. You're setting up what you expect to be the result of uh, inside of your environment. You need those to be versioned and immutable. It turns out Git uh, gives us that, right? Because that's a fundamental aspect of Git itself, uh, but it doesn't dictate that it has to be Git. It has to be version and immutable. So I have to be able to go back to particular versions and that can't change depending on how things went and move forward. I need those pulled automatically. So these declarative versioned uh, objects pulled automatically into my cluster. And I want the cluster or the, the instance that's dealing with those uh, declarative things pulled in to continuously reconcile. Because remember I said, it's not just a one way, you know, build, build me up to three instances, it's keep me at three instances. So if somebody added a fourth, I need it bring, brought back down to three, right? Because I'm paying for that or, or whatever you're doing in that environment. So very important, these principles, because these kind of, hopefully you see the correlation between Kubernetes itself and right, GitOps itself. So declarative version of immutable, pulled automatically and continuously reconciled. And again, these aren't just Weaveworks as principles. These are Weaveworks uh, participating with companies like Red Hat, Azure, uh, working CodeFresh uh, to pull together what we all believe are the right principles for this environment. So how does that benefit a business? So um, we, can, we can surface metrics, right, about how GitOps works because we know uh, those principles there in, in your environments uh, that'll have the same metrics depending on the different clusters, whether, again, we talked about self-hosted versus using a cloud versus dev, test and prod, all of those can have the same metrics there. We can have improved security. What does this mean? So I mentioned before that it's a pull model versus a push model. So in a pull model, I give the, the credentials to the puller, not the pusher. So in a traditional CI CD, and I will talk about in a second about this, but the traditional CD would have to know all of the permissions and all the credentials of everything it's pushing to. Uh, but when we flip that model on its head and say, well, no, it's a pull based model. I only have to tell the, the, the single instance where he pulls it and what keys he use. Uh, with having a standardized model that isn't a, uh, you know, a set of bash scripts or whatever in order to do it, I can have easier compliance. And of course, with that comes standardization and auditability. So that's benefits for the business. How does it benefit a developer? So developer has easier deploy. So they don't have to remember all of the commands, all of the keys, all of the different clusters because they create code, check that code in, have it built and it's deployed. Right? depending of course on how you've configured your GitOps pipelines to work, but that's what we wanna do. So, and, and why is this uh, important here of that cycle of being able to write some code, commit some code, get a build and all that. So I don't know if you're, if you're a developer like me, then you've, you've encountered instances, oh, I don't know, maybe like three weeks ago when the known host change happened with GitHub, right? Uh, all of a sudden everybody's known host had old keys in it that we had to fix up. If I go look at my shell history, I can see all of the imperative commands I did in order to fix my known host file on my machine. But guess what one of those entries is? One of those entries is VI known host, right? That's it, that's all the visibility I have into it. I can't reproduce that. I have an idea of what I did, but I can't reproduce that. In a GitOps model, all of those would have been committed entries into the system. And I would have just defined something like, I, my known host needs to look like this. And so I would be able to go to Git and see a diff between known host today and known host and what it was before. 
And that's really a lot of the power here that, that you get with having that history and that standardization of how things get applied to your system and how I can go back and understand exactly what I did in the past and how it's not so easy in an imperative manner. So if you're a platform team, so the business you know, has its benefits, developers and all that, platforms can leverage a lot of the same instances. So if the platform team is building uh, an environment for developer teams to use, right? They're gonna set up a standard way of getting information deployed and uh, workloads deployed into clusters, right? So gone are those days of that kubectl apply because they could do it via GitOps. The permission model we talked about, we're gonna push that out to where it's a pull versus push model. Uh, we have easier rollbacks and you know easier promotion models. So we're not gonna talk much about promotions here. We have a product called Flagger that Tamil mentioned, uh, but you can take a look at that. How do we do a progressive rollout? Well, having things stored in Git and having commits and being able to roll forward and commits and roll back is all key, right? To be able to solve a lot of these big problems that have been difficult to, to solve in the past. Again, with Git as our model, we can talk about tracking changes and all of that because everything's a Git commit. And again, we're trying to standardize that whole delivery model. And when you pair Kubernetes and its declarative nature with GitOps and being able to have that history, it's a perfect match. Um, so back to the high level, what is, what is GitOps? Declarative configuration, version controlled immutable artifacts. We have that single source of truth. I know where I can go look to figure out what went wrong with my environment. But it's more, right? It has automated delivery. So it's that pull model versus the push model. Um, but it's automated delivery of, again, declarative resources, right? So back to those fundamental principles that we talked about, it's gotta be declarative. Um, so we have agents running in the cluster. That's the part of GitOps that we're gonna talk about, or David's gonna actually walk us through a good example using Flux. Um, of those agents running the cluster that are doing that reconciliation for us to make sure that Git, our single source of truth, matches what's running in our Kubernetes cluster. And this is all that closed loop that we talked about, right? So we are, you know, we're checking into Git, it's getting pulled in automatically, and we're reconciling that dynamically for us. So looking at kind of a picture here, so if you're a developer, you're gonna write some YAML, which is the declarative uh, based declarative uh, definition for Kubernetes objects and, and your applications. You're gonna check that into Git. You're gonna have our agents sync. It's gonna deploy it to Kubernetes. And it's gonna, again, that constant reconciliation, right? So this isn't a set of steps that we're gonna run through and then call it good. We're gonna constantly be trying to achieve your desired state which is the key point uh, that we want here, that that's where GitOps and Kubernetes uh, work really well together. So comparing that to, to a more traditional model, of course, you're gonna have developers. They're gonna write code. Uh, they're gonna check that code into Git. We're gonna have a CI system that builds it. And again, the CI system still applies in the GitOps model. It's just the CD piece that has been uh, supplanted with GitOps. So the CI is gonna run a Docker build. It's gonna to push to a registry and they're gonna iterate over that process there. But in the traditional model, then you're gonna have a CD step that's gonna do more of a kubectl apply to an API in Kubernetes but it needs that secret in order to do it, right? And so that's where we talk about that security model is we're not gonna push that secret into the CD for all of my different clusters that I need to work with. We're gonna flip that model around so that the cluster itself has the secret uh, or the credentials that it needs. Um, and then of course the Kubernetes cluster is gonna pull data from the registry. So in summary, uh, so it's a Git-centric way of implementing continuous delivery. Again, it's at a, at a super high level, pull versus push model is an easy way to think about it. Uh, you're going to get benefits of increased productivity, enhanced developer experience, uh, better stability, higher reliability, of course, consistency and standardization, which is key, really key here, uh, and stronger security guarantees by that push versus pull model and other aspects that are there. Uh, the four principles that we talked about, again, declarative, version controlled and immutable, automatically pulled into the system and continuously reconciled. And that continuously reconciled is that, that really important piece. So again, we are decoupling CI from CD. You still need CI, I gotta have it. You're gonna have CD, only we're gonna flip the model around and let it be a GitOps pull-based model here. So I know I went really fast uh, intentionally, but uh, do we have any questions or anything I missed or are we ready to move to David? Thank you. Yeah, we had a little bit more of a discussion in the um, chat thread because someone was asking just kind of more broadly, like, you know, does this work with Ansible and uh, Sir Constant, a couple other nice questions. Um, and uh, 
I think it was uh, Vyacheslav had mentioned, you know, Ansible doesn't seem to truly follow immutable principles. And David was sharing some thoughts of, about that, how we focus kind of more on Kubernetes. But yeah, I just thought if you had any comments about that, I mean, you maybe you come across people who, you know, I, I have friends who love Ansible. Like, you know, what would be the thinking if um, they are, is it some, something they have to completely rethink the model or are there some examples where people do kind of a mix? in your experience yeah i haven't unco yeah because there there can be a mix so you could define a bunch of uh declarative steps and then have ansible run that but i think it's really that reconciliation piece that's the key is to, you know because a lot of the ansible is you know execute till done and the git ops what we're going to do is no like make sure it's in that state and and maintain it in that state and so, I, I mean, I haven't had a ton of experience with Ansible and uh, uh, and I'm not sure, I bet I'm gonna get them confused, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt. Um, but I didn't think that they had that reconciliation aspect to when things drift, right? And that's such a common problem in production systems is somebody hops on there thinking they're gonna help out and they change something and then something doesn't work and we have no record of it, yes. right? And so having that, having that constantly reconciled thing is really important. And that immutable state, I can't, can't iterate that enough. If I, can, if I can throw something away and get it right back to what it was before, that's really powerful. And yeah. so, yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer there, but I, but I have seen to where you can uh, codify some of those imperative steps into an object or a controller, define that as a Kubernetes declarative option, and then have that controller execute those steps inside there. But that's a little bit of a different thing. You'd have to also make sure all those steps are item potent uh, and all that sort of stuff that goes along with that constant reconciliation. Yes. Um, we have a few, they, they weren't posted to everyone, but they don't look very private. So hopefully it's okay if I read it. Um, one question is that um, they use a GitLab CI runner on the target environments. And so saying, is this the same as Flux, as we mentioned, the open source project that we support that provides GitOps? Um, how good is it to go out of GitLab native tools? So a bit of a flex specific question, but hopefully it's also relevant to how you're thinking about how to set up for GitOps. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because I, I, I mean, I haven't looked at GitLab, but I think they have some uh, GitOps things, but I don't think it, ma it, it matches all four principles that are there. So I think it depends, as with software, right? It depends. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if you're bought into that whole ecosystem and you want to leverage all of those pieces, you can, uh, but really the power of moving those, just those certificates into the poll-based model is hugely powerful. Right? Because if somebody compromises your GitLab, they have the keys to the castle and all of your all of your systems. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't know. I don't I don't have a great answer for that because I I'm not as intimate with uh, the CI runner that that uh, GitLab does provide. Yeah. And um after this we'll share or I guess during this we'll also share our Slack channel. So happy to follow up. You know, we've got obviously Plenty of people who are much more well versed in Flux and um, might know some of that. So happy to follow up there. Um, we also have a comment. Um, it's excellent overview, Mark. And also, I'm curious on distributed systems. Are there definitive measurements slash analytics available? Oh boy, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, yes, there are. Right? There's different. There's you know, yeah. So. So Kubernetes is going to expose, or it gives you the ability to expose all sorts of metrics across all of your systems and Flux does as well, so that you can interrogate what it's actually doing inside there. But you're going to pair that with something like a Prometheus in order to gather up all your metrics. And then you are going to follow different, uh, depending on your environment, you know, are you going to use the use method? Or are you going to use the red uh, theory of how you determine if your environments are up and operational? So. So yes, there are, but boy, that's a, a much more complicated uh, topic uh, than what we're prepared to talk about here. <laughs> the answer is yes, but there's a lot in that question. Yeah. Um, so, and I th good think, question, Jazz. Yeah, I think also going back to the Ansible question and the GitLab questions, um, you know, I think that maybe the higher level answer is also, you know, that people are gonna do a mixture of stuff. You know, we're not in a place of like, 
you must do pure GitOps. You know, people are going to do what works for them. But I think what's really valuable is um, what uh, Mark shared with the open GitOps group that's in the CNCF, right? They, they're a group of people representing many, many companies deeply in this space, us included. And so I think, you know, the, the goal of the principles is to have something published so that, you know, there's agreement there that, um, you know, those are the beginning points of, um, of GitOps. And so if you're, you know, and, and we've had talks before where everybody's like, just start with one of them. You know, you, you don't get GitOps overnight. You, it's a journey. So work with one of the principles that you think is most uh, achievable and then kind of work your way up. And hopefully the, the goals of having those as published principles is that at the end you get all the massive benefits, right? So maybe it'll be more clear to you if you're still getting benefits by having some kind of hybrid, then that's great. But if you start it becomes clearer that you aren't gaining some benefits because of some changes that you need to make, then that's something your team can uh, discuss and decide. So hopefully we're, we're here to help you on your, your journey. Uh, solid. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> cool. So with that, if any questions come up later, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, but otherwise, we'll move on to the uh, hands on section. And I'll give a, a brief overview of, um, again, I, like the cooked meal to uh, get people, um, you know, set on the vision of the goal. And I, you know, Mark set some great examples there. Hopefully you can see my uh, oops, I hope this shows slide view, not presenter view. Okay, people can see my slides, Stacy. I hope so. Yep. Um, great. Uh, so today uh, we've talked a lot about Flux as being this open source project that kind of kicked off the term GitOps and, um, you know, is in the CNCF. And, you know, we have many people using it, using it in production very successfully. And, guiding us on, you know, where we're going to take people on their journey to GitOps. Uh, and today we're going to focus on, um, as I mentioned, many products are built on, on Flux now by many companies. And, and we have ours, we have GitOps that we wanted to make sure helped a larger audience be able to take advantage of the power of Flux that, you know, may prefer to have certain kind of maybe opinionated perspectives or um, having some of the experience abstracted out for them, you know, so for those who want like more custom things, there's always Flux and we've GitOps is designed to help people um, be successful in broader ways. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that we're from Weaveworks. In the context of this product, you know, we are committed to helping you transition on your cloud native journey wherever you are, if you're at the beginning or you're maturing through, you know, we're committed through our products, through the consulting that we offer. Um, and so we've built this product that um, is uh, works on any Kubernetes. So whether you're an on prem or in the cloud, you know, we want to make sure that it works for you. Uh, and as I said, we coined the term from these experiences. We've been running Kubernetes in production for at this point, um, seven years, I think, um, with our first SaaS product that also used Flux in it. Uh, and so we're really committed to, you know, being leaders in this space. And you know, it's been a great journey to see so many enterprise companies working with us and using our products. Um, so one of the things that's really critical, uh, if you've come to any of our talks, is that uh, there's a lot of proof that velocity, uh, you know, Mark talked about the business benefits and the benefits to developers across the board, velocity, velocity is um, a key area and has lots of metrics on the types of companies that have worked on improving their velocity. They've worked, they've been able to um, grow faster, uh, IPO faster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so GitOps is a key part of that. And that's why it's really important to us. You know, we want to make sure that you've lowered your chances of failed deploys. Um, you know, the way GitOps is set up, you know, you have the audit trail. So um, troubleshooting is easier. You can see what happened. Uh, reliability is critical, right? We talked to so many of our users of Flux in our products and they just said you know the, the change is that like my teams can have more work-life balance um, you know they can they can make changes to prod much more reliably because there's a, a review process and there's this audit trail um, and that all leads to also you know lower mean time to recovery uh, people might know the famous story at our company where one engineer made a change and brought our entire system down and because we didn't even know the term GitOps, but we had these practices in place and uh, we were able to bring the system back up in less than an hour. And so that was really uh, an eye opener. And we thought, well, let's let's continue to work in this space. So 
again, yes, the velocity is a core part of that and GitOps helps make that possible. So with Weave GitOps, you know, our product that we've built is importantly because of this Kubernetes native and Flux native. And by that we mean, you know, it's built on Flux. We want to make sure that you can, you can depend upon having all the Flux capabilities um, just in a way, as I mentioned, that's, um, you know, abstracted and opinionated for particular users who would prefer to have that because Flux can be kind of you know, what's so beautiful, it is so unopinionated, but it can, it can be maybe overwhelming for users who have particular needs and want to get started right away. So that's why we built Weave GitOps. Um, important to iterate that it is for apps and ops teams. GitOps is available for, you know, all those capabilities. Um, and as I mentioned with our GitOps one-stop shop event, it's really, um, you know, affirming to see all these companies, Microsoft, VMware, AWS, D2IQ, Red Hat, all uh, trusting uh, these Flux capabilities to provide GitOps to their customers, right? So we both have customers of GitOps and users of GitOps through uh, Flux and Weave GitOps, but we also have these partners who, you know, see the reliability of that software and that's really really reassuring and our goal is to build a total product right so deploy connectivity to your ci as mark mentioned you know you don't get rid of your ci it's part of the system uh your workflows your observability etc so that is what we're building toward and hopefully you'll be able to see some of that um, We've talked about the GitOps maturity model. And so if you're starting out, you're at the zero level, you know, you're doing single apps, GitOps, and then as you reach your way to the top, you know, you're doing multi-tenancy, you're caring about policy, you're having complex managements of your systems. So, you know, we're here and have been helping many, many enterprise companies continue on that goal. Uh, and so, you know, we are here for every step of that goal, and that's our commitment with our company and our product. As I mentioned, we have products as well as consulting and teaching and a variety of things that can help you along the way. Uh, and finally, just reiterating again, the importance of velocity gives you resilience, automation, uh, CD for your app deployments, and again, decreased mean time for recovery. And What's important is um, Weave GitOps has an open source component, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So it's open source, you can get started. There are questions about a UI. Um, we have a UI that's part of it. You'll be able to see that as we go through the steps, and um, hopefully they'll be useful for you. Uh, so with that, we will go through the steps. Um, hopefully this is you know, your vision toward you know, what you'll benefit from, and David here will get you through the getting started steps. Um, everybody starts from different places, so we will take this very slowly. I hope nobody is shy about asking questions um, or you know, troubleshooting or getting through the steps, so we'll get to that. With that, David, why don't I switch over to you? Hello, good yes. evening. Um, all right, so let me share my screen because we are going to do the getting started guide. So the first thing you need to do is go to our doc site. It's docs.gitops.vh.works. And we are going to do the getting started guide. I think so, Stacy added the link to the chat. So hopefully everybody can click on that link. Let us know if you yes. have any problems with it. Oh, and it's, uh, I know sometimes we talked about the version. So if they go to slash getting started, that'll go to this version that you're showing. Yes, we're gonna, there... we're gonna of course work on the latest version we have, which is okay. 0 0.5. Okay. And basically what you need as prerequisites, I hope you all have a GitHub account. Um, and if you don't, should... we can wait for you to set that up. So no problem, but um, yeah, go ahead. We need kubectl installed and we need the capabilities that you can create a, a cluster. Um, we're gonna show it with kind. If you want to install kind, it's very easy. You need, it requires as well Docker. Um, if you use Minikube or something else, it will work as well. So, but you need the capability to, to have a cluster running. If you want, you can as well go and, and use EKS cuttle from us and create an Amazon a, a cluster. It doesn't really matter. Um, but if you just want to follow the getting started guide step by step, you need, we're gonna do it with kind. 
Okay, great. And yes, we've definitely had people who hadn't had kind installed yet and it went really quickly. So um, please like raise your hand or send us a note if um, you need to set any of these up and certainly no, don't be shy. Don't, there's no reason to be embarrassed. There's plenty of people who are strictly like GitLab or Git or Git Bitbucket or something. And so um, it's not unusual for people to not have a GitHub account as well. So um, if you could raise your hand or just send us some kind of sign so we know um, who we should wait for, um, it's no problem at all. Like I said, these, these steps uh, go fairly quickly and uh, it's something we do for all the workshops. So, and, and uh, yeah. yeah, if anybody hasn't used Kind before, let us know. Uh, it seems like it's gone pretty smoothly at all of our past workshops. As well, just to set expectations, what we're going to do is we're going to um, install GitOps and Flux on a cluster, yeah, GitOps, and then we're going to deploy uh, a, a real workload to it. And then we're going to try a bit to, to be nasty and, and do some, some stuff to it so we can see the power of, of GitOps, which Mark already has a bit showed us, but we're going to put it into practice, right, so that we can really experience what you can get out of this if you do it yourself. Um, and like my colleague just mentioned, GitLab will work as well. Um, feel free to use GitLab. But what we're gonna show is by the hands-on step-by-step, we're gonna show how it works with, with GitHub. Yeah, but you should be able easily to translate the steps into GitLab. Yeah. Should we start, Hama, or do we still wait? Uh, yeah, please let us know. We um, like we have plenty of time, and it's really important for us to make sure that everybody has a great experience and can get through. If anybody's fast, they get faster, and that's no problem at all. But if you're uh, more on the setup side, um, then let us know. And um, it's good to know. I that's new to me. I didn't know about the GitLab thing, so I guess um, that's in the the docs as well. So I'll I'll remember that for future ones. We obviously have some GitLab users here, so. It'd be good that they don't have to set up a new account. Um, anybody else? Anybody going through the three prerequisite steps? Uh, like I said, they go pretty quickly, so it's not a problem at all to wait. We want to make sure. Okay. Yes. I see a yes. Is yes, meaning uh, you're going through the installation, or yes, you've got them all <laughs> installed. I like yes. Yes is affirmative. Great. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure we uh, are following you correctly. Um, make sure everybody has a good experience. Um, ah, yes, I have yeah, kind, so. but not any Kubernetes cluster yet. That's Excellent. Fine. Anybody else need a few more minutes for? Yeah, anyone not ready? Thank you, Mark. Anyone not ready? Anyone need a few more minutes? Uh, I'm not set up today, but we'll watch again. Okay, sure. And uh, Stacy will share the Slack uh, links so that um, sometimes, yes, we do have some people who um, have to finish afterwards and we finish up in Slack. So that's great. Um, that's pretty interesting that people have some pretty heavy uh, volumes of data that they're dealing with today. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, All right. All right. So All right. Is let's, everybody good? Let's do the we'll first start. step. So the first step we need to do is we need to install our CLI tool, so we have GitOps CLI, and it's quite straightforward. You're gonna copy this this curl command, and we're gonna paste it in our in our terminal. Um, and it's gonna require a password. Oh, sorry. Why is it not doing it now? One second. And basically you need to install the CLI tool. And it will ask you probably for permissions. So it will require that you probably enter your password. Mm -hmm. 
And now when it's done, you should see this. So you should see that the current version we are running is 0 0.5, the version we want to install and the docs are on. And you should see that under the cover, we are using the Flux version 0 0.21. And that's basically it. So um, when we have done this, we need to create a repo. And this repo will be basically our GitOps config repo. Basically in this repo, we're gonna manage our GitOps configuration. And we need to first create this. So we go to GitHub and we go to, to your repository, to, to your where you can create your repositories. You're gonna create a new one and you're gonna call it GitOps config. You can, if you want, you can call it different, but keep in mind that the getting started guide is basically based on the specific name, but feel free to change this, it, it, it works. The only important thing is that we need to initialize a repo. So basically if we add a readme file, we will do a first commit and this is important because we need a branch and this will help us to directly have main as the default branch. Once we have done this, we cre pinch create. And this will give us an, an empty repo with an empty readme, but the, the repo is initialized and this is what we really care about. Um, we will quickly as well do the next step, which is basically we're gonna look at pot info deploy and pot info deploy is this application we can see here, but this is not the application itself. So if you want to see um, the application itself, so this is the application the, the written by, by the Flux team and the repository we are caring about here, this one, this contains basically the Kubernetes instructions to deploy pod info deploy successfully. And this is basically what we really care about for today because we're gonna set up with, with VA GitOps a continuous delivery pipeline to Kubernetes. And this is containing this repository, the, the deployment manifest we care about. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fork this one and we're gonna fork it to our personal account. And We've this noted book. here, we've noted here each time, it's very important to fork, right? Yes, please. Because uh, sometimes people jump through the instructions quickly and uh, they we miss and this is Elaborate on step. why. Yes, yeah. <laughs> David, do you want to elaborate on why it's really important to fork? Yes, because we're going to... Um, need to add a deploy key to it and we need to have ownership of the repository to to do this um mark do you want to add something to this I, no i was just going to say that because I, I don't want people to like, get the impression in order to use we get ops that they always have to fork their repository it's no. it's the fact that you don't we don't own that pod info deploy repo so we need to create a fork so that we can add uh, either, uh, like you said, David, deploy keys or any of the GitOps automation that we're going to work on uh, to that repo. And we don't have permissions to do that on PodInfo. But if you own the repo, because you will for your own applications, you don't have to fork. Yeah. So, and if we have done this, we already come basically to, to the next step, which is basically now it's getting serious. We need our Kubernetes cluster <laughs> and we're going to set up a cluster. Yes, and before we do, just want to check in with everybody. Um, no shame if you're still working on the prerequisites, the snow, um, or anybody needed. We didn't. Okay, so it's a comment from our other PM on the guides. Um, yeah, so just checking if anybody's still working on the prerequisites, steps one and two. Um, if you are, if you need just a minute or two, if you 
are not ready to move to creating the cluster, let us know. We want to make sure that everyone's having a experience of going through these steps. Okay, see another yes. Okay. All right, let's let's kick it off. So basically what we need to do is if you have using kind, it's very easy, you write kind create cluster. And this will initialize my, my cluster. You can see how it, it it's bringing up the nodes. Um, starting the control plane. And the only thing I need to do once it's up is to, to basically export the cube config to my to set my cube to enable my cube cutter to basically access this cluster. So let's give it a moment. And here it is. So our cluster is alive. So the only thing is, like I said, we need to set the right cube config. Um, we copy and paste this. And here we are. Our cluster is alive. I set here up, basically, if you're wondering what is happening on my right side, I, I set up two, two watchers and we are watching two namespaces. And you can see that currently this cluster is empty because we are going to watch the test names, the namespace test, and we're going to watch the namespace Vigo system. And you will see that during this, this getting started guide, stuff will happen in this namespaces. We have a question. It says, can you combine clusters with blockchain solutions? That's quite a question. I mean, I think blockchain is a bit orthogonal to 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 Kubernetes. Um, I'm I'm unsure what you are after. I'm pretty sure you can run if you want a blockchain service or something like this in 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 Kubernetes. Um, so maybe if the, if you could explain a bit more what you would like to understand, then we can maybe better help you. So, any other questions from anybody? All right, and uh, yes, reminder: <laughs> we're going through the steps in the. Uh, End goal is to gain all these GitOps benefits around velocity, reliability, etc. So hopefully you'll be able to see that. All right, let's move forward. Okay. So the next step is, and now we need to be careful, is we're going to install VF GitOps on the Kubernetes cluster. And we're going to target the repo we, we created just moments before, which is GitOps config. And you will see here that username is a, is a variable that we need to set. So you cannot just copy this command and paste it, it will fail. What you need to do is you need to copy it and to adapt the part where username is. If you have given your repository a different names in GitOps config, you need as well to change this. So in this case, my username is David Stauffer and I'm gonna execute this command. GitOps install with this flag, which is basically the config repo we want to set. And we give them the direction of this config repo. And now you can see it's kicking off the steps. And now you can see how basically our, in our Kubernetes clusters, our Helm controller, our image automation controller, our customized controller, our notification controller, and source controller are coming up, which is basically all the machinery from, from Flux and we have GitOps that we need to keep your cluster in sync with, with what you have defined in, in the GitOps repo. So this takes a moment. Can I add a little context here, David? Would that be okay? Yes, please. Yeah, so I, uh, in my uh, discussion where I talked about an overview of kind of Kubernetes and 
and GitOps. And I mentioned something called a cloud native kind of architecture. So you may be wondering what are all, all of these things that David Edge shows up here running. And so what Flux does uh, is it separates out the pulling and talking to Git, right? The pulling of things and then the applying of those pieces to the system. So you separate all those concerns, you run those as separate entities inside of your Kubernetes environment. So each of these has a controller and they manage their state and their logic all separately, right? So that's the whole benefit of having a Kubernetes environment with the cloud native architecture, because that allows us, <clears throat> for instance, to scale the number of applying processes as an example for the cluster, right? And with if you just had a single container that was doing all that work, it would be much more difficult to scale, uh, et cetera. So that's why you see so many controllers starting up here because that's our cloud native architecture. Hope that helped. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe it made it worse. So you can see only two controllers are left and All right, one second and we should be here. Maybe I should have given my kind class a bit more resources. I so here we are and now we need we have two options and i'm going to show you the option that we do off manually you can as well set as environment variable your github token you need to create one and then you don't need to do this in my case we need to do this and now we need to authenticate with this url with git so what we're going to do is we're going to paste this url I had a question going back to your talking about giving resources. Is that something that we have in uh, the doc in the uh, docs, like best practices on how many resources to give to your cluster? Um, I, I don't think it's currently part of our best uh, in the docs. You can find in, in, in kind and as well, you can directly mm -hmm. set in Docker how much you, you give it in, in terms of memory. Mm -hmm. um, but we could add this. so. Now we have authorized this device, and now you can see a deploy key is generated. And here we are. So now we are wondering what happened. And if we now go to, to our repository and I think to this one, GitOps config, we should see this folder structure. And this folder structure is now basically containing our, our manifests, our runtime manifests to basically control what is happening on our cluster. Um, and Mark E can explain more about our directory structure if he wants, um, but we can as well just go pragmatic about it and start with the next step and kick off our UI. I saw there were questions before about UI and now you can see our we have GitOps UI. So you just run this command, GitOps UI run. And now you can see we have basically, it's empty our cluster. We have no applications on it. And we clearly want to change this, right? We want to do something more useful with our cluster. So what we're gonna do is we have here the button at application. And what we're going to do is we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it pot info deploy. Um, we're going to specify the namespace um, where the GitOps automation objects will be stored, but we go system is fine for this. We're going to specify basically the source repo URL and 
now comes, we need to be careful, right? This whole series URL is in my case, for example, this one, right? Because we want to deploy, put in for deploy, the repository we forked. So that's the URL, right? Make sure you, you add basically this in HTTPS before. And the config repo URL, if you remember, it's the GitOps config one we specified before. And basically that's all what we need to do right now. And if you have filled out this, this form, you can do the same through the CLI. So, but we're gonna show you today our, our UI path. And basically that's it. And you can see how smart our system is because it already detected GitHub. And now we move forward. We say submit. Oh, that's weird. Ah, now we need to authenticate with Git. That's true. So we're going to do the same exercise because now it's our UI which needs to authenticate with Git. And pinch continue, authorize. And now we should be able to submit. We also have a question. Uh, we talked about uh, GitLab being an option, but there's also questions about Bitbucket or code commit. I think currently we, 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 we don't support Bitbucket. Um, so we can add this to our, our roadmap. Nice. Um, and so now we created a pull I request. Very sorry, important. we had another one. Um, and then code commit, I guess. I, I'm not familiar with code commit, actually. I guess that's another option. That's Amazon's, is that right? That might be Amazon's Git okay. server. Uh, yes, says so uh, like So I guess. I, had, I would just say, please add uh, issues to the GitOps repo uh, for, for supporting these things. Because as David mentioned, you know, we have to prioritize our work and we can get that, you know, priority in there and, it, and it's helpful. The issues opened yes. external to us. Yes. yes. And uh, now, oh, yeah. now we are at a key moment, right? Because we, we, we want that this happens through pull request, right? Because this guarantees us that there is some human audit, right? Some human control. So, Normally, somebody else should review this pull request, right? But let's, we are not really today um, about best practice. So I'm going to review my own pull request. We can see actually what files we are changing. So we're going to add this, this deployment. And we're going to add here, you can see this customization. And basically, that's mostly it. And Let's imagine everything is fine. We're gonna approve our pull request. Oh, I can, oh no, I can, I'm probably myself, so this doesn't work. So we're gonna directly merge this um, because it didn't let me approve my own pull request. But if Mark would have reviewed my pull request, he could review it and approve it or make comments on it. We don't need this branch anymore. So we're going to delete this branch. And that's basically it. And now what should happen is um, we should hear seeing coming up in this test namespace, the resources, and we see this. But as well, more importantly, we can see this in our UI. So now we can see we have an application, which is put in for deploy. And we can see basically the deployment tree, all the resources we have created in the cluster. We can see in, in what conditions are our source is, which is good, and our customization, our automation, and we can see what is the current applied revision. And you can see it's basically the same as we have fetched from our Git repo, so they are in sync, this is great. And we can see as well, directly we are fetching the latest commits to it. And if we want, we can directly click on one of this, this, this 
IDs of the shards and we can dig deeper what they are about. So that's a very nice feature from our UI. Um, now I lost the UI, sorry. Where is it? I think I need to go back. Yes. And that's basically it. So now we are already pretty far down in our getting started guide. Let me check how far are we. Um, yes, we have seen the application details. And now we want to see as well that the application is really running, right? And for this, we don't, in this example we are showing you, we are not setting up a complex ingress. So we do something a bit more simple, which is a port forward for our front end. Um, so we go back to, um, let me open a new shell, a new tab. And we're gonna kubectl port forward. And if we do this, what we should see, as well as the getting started guide, if we now browse to, to local host, we will see that it's running. That is basically pod info deploy. It's alive. Cool. And we have a question if there's a good moment for it. Uh, okay. So the question is, uh, so a test application was deployed in the test namespace. I wonder if you could show the namespace test in GitHub. Yes. Um, it's defined like David Harris mentioned in the, in the deployment manifest of it, which is here. Yeah. It's basically part of this one. Thanks for that. All question. right. Um, where are we? Um, now we want to see what happens, for example, a bad actor, right? So I think this is really key part of it because um, this is why GitOps is so important. It will give you confidence in, in your deployment strategy. And if you have confidence in your deployment strategy, you will deploy more frequently because you're not afraid to, to pull the trigger. And this is what we're gonna show you essentially. So let's assume something goes really wrong. And we're gonna, what we show you now is some, somebody deletes, for example, the, the front end deployment in the namespace test. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open another shell. Yeah. And we're going to execute this command, which is basically delete deployment and now you can see that this port is terminating, right? And what will happen is that in a very few seconds, it will come up again automatically because it's reconciling out of Git that this should not happen. Let's give it a moment. And you can see it's coming up again and we did nothing. It's just, and this we really, really can be thankful to, to Flux because we have GitOps and Flux to care of this. So you can see, even if you have a bad actor, you don't need to be afraid because um, basically it has covered your back. So this is, what I really love about GitOps and I cannot emphasize enough about this because it's really, really making it so beautiful um, when a team has really confidence in their deployment strategy. And let's assume we can as well make a desired change, right? So we want, for example, to, to change and uh, 
a setting uh, environment variable we inject into our pod info. And in this case, what we're gonna do is um, change the, the pod info UI color. There are a couple of ways we, how we can do this. Um, so this is basically recommending you that you do it through um, directly um, in, in your deployment.yaml. But we can do it as well more visual. We can, because we have here the repo, we have here our, yes, our. Letting you know we have a question. Is this a good time? Um, yeah, of course, every time is a good time. <laughs> I think it kind of relates to sort of the beauty of GitOps that you were talking about, because the uh, question was, who made the pod come back up? I'm guessing it was all the code running under the Wego system namespace. <laughs> I mean, to a degree, it's Kubernetes, um, and to a degree, it's um, it's Wego at Flux. So Flux made sure that basically, it detected that this resource is not anymore existing and there's a drift and it made sure that it gets recreated in the cluster because it's fetching it again from the source. Yeah, great question, great answer, because it goes back to what Mark was talking about, right? Just sort of GitOps being this evolution of Kubernetes because there is this core functionality there and Flux is extending the, the core functionality. So hopefully that, that clarifies so that. What we're going to do is we're going to into our front end deployment.yaml in our pod info repo and we're going to edit this file. And what we're going to do is, where is it? I need just to shuffle around a bit. And we're going to edit this value, which is the pod info UI color. Let me see what we recommend as a color. And this is the value you want to put. It's six times the eight. So let's do that. Um, and what we're going to do is, we want to wait, I don't see something. We're going to commit the changes and create a new branch and create a pull request. So this is our patch one branch. We propose the change. Um, again, right? It's governing by pull request. Let's say um, our peers have agreed that this is a good idea to do. Um, they, they, they determine this is nice. We're gonna merge this pull request. They're gonna confirm the merge. We're gonna clean up, delete the branch. And now, if we go to our pod info thing, we will, first of all, we will see that basically there's a new front end pod coming up. So this is basically the beauty of Kubernetes itself. So it will bring up a new pod and then it will start to shift traffic to this new pod and then it will terminate the old one. So this is something we should see in a couple of seconds. Now you can see that this new front end pod is coming up. Um, and it does all this progressive delivery for us. We don't need to worry about this. And it's now ready and it will start to terminate the old one. So this is really the beauty of, of Kubernetes. It takes care of all of this. And if we reload this, it should be gray in a second. Or maybe I need to restart my pond from border, yes. This has died. So if you would use an, a nice ingress, you wouldn't have this problem. So you can see, but now it's great. You can see it worked. And now let's say this brought your, your somebody is really in trouble because it didn't want grow gray and, and your department is freaking out and they're coming to you. We need to do something, right? And this is the, the beauty of Git. We can easily roll back. So we go basically to, to our, pod info repo, we look at our pull request, we look at the one we have just closed. Um, and 
we open this up and we say revert the change. We want to, to go this back. So as well as the revert of the change is again a pull request to make sure that this is really what we want. And we're gonna do the same. We're gonna say merge it. And we're gonna see how basically imagine something really bad happened, how you could roll back and restore your system in, in minutes and in seconds. And we will see again the magic of Kubernetes. So let's give it a second. It's bringing up the new container. Um, it's starting to shift traffic and it's terminating the old one. Um, I'm gonna, just going to restart my port forwarder. And if I go here now, oh, not yet. It's blue again, and we restored our environment to the desired state we had before. So this is how you can have really confidence in your deployment strategy and what will really, really help you to iterate more quickly, ship more quickly value to your customers because you are less afraid of, of bringing something into production. This is basically, I think most of the getting started guide. We are complete. And I think the rollback was even a bit um, an extra, which is not part, but I think it's always really nice to show. That's it. Questions, comments. I'm just looking at the threads, we were having some conversations. Um, yes, let me check the time as well. Anybody have other questions or again, some people are not shy and they say, oh, I'm still in step three, which is totally fine. Happy to help you. Um, and yeah, Mark, was this a place maybe if you wouldn't mind talking uh, off the cuff? Uh, we've talked about you know the flux capabilities uh, that you can use through Weave GitOps Core. We've talked about um, one of the huge strengths of Flux is that it's uh, designed to work very very well with Helm, and we have some great uh, customer stories of people who just knew that. Flux was something they were going to use because of the great integration and because of that they could use the sort of ecosystem that comes with Helm and that was really necessary for their team. So that's definitely one of the capabilities we have. Also works with Customize. We talked about notifications. I don't know if there's anything here you want to kind of highlight that people can look forward to once they've gone through these getting started steps and can uh, take advantage of. Yeah, yeah, actually, a couple of things uh, that that I think are important uh, concepts. So, so one, yeah, the so we did a very simple application pod info, right? It has a front end and a back end. We changed the color, right? That's that clearly illustrates all the benefits of GitOps. But what happens when you get to a more complicated environment? So, if uh, I don't know if David, you want to share again, but under the example section in the docs, we talk about an old microservice application that we had that had a lot of moving parts. And we walk through the example of how you would deploy this with Weave GitOps, including some of the Helm charts there. So David showed you uh, deploying a, a customization based application via the UI. Uh, in the CLI today, you can also deploy Helm charts directly that way. Um, and then one additional thing, David, do you mind sharing your screen again with the repo that I wanted to point out? Of course, I can do this. Um, let me share my screen again. So what do you want yeah. to show? Is it GitOps so if, config? Yeah, so if you notice that the, so we have the Weave GitOps config and then we we kind of glanced over it quickly or by quickly, but you see there's that clusters kind kind in there. So we've installed Flux into your cluster and we need to bootstrap that into the cluster but it's pointing back at this repository and everything that's in there that we installed is represented as manifest inside of this Git repository. So what that's gonna do then for your benefit, uh, if you go to the system directory, 
is when you do an upgrade or you change versions of Flux or you want to you know, specialize something inside the Flux configuration, the manifests that we installed are available there. So that's how we installed the, the system there. But that's kind of using uh, Flux to manage itself. And I think that's a really important construct that are is, you know, we're using it to manage itself. So, yeah, as well, GitOps is a platform. And, and this tie nice tightly and in, into the other question somebody had. Let me open the, the chat panel again. I don't find the chat panel. Um, basically, the first usage of GitOps, the question was, was bootstrapping the Vigo system namespace? Um, so basically, the first bootstrap is um, we are installing Flux on it, and then we are as well making sure we, we hook it up to this repo and creating the files. And from there on, your whole platform is really GitOps. And then basically, the first time we really use GitOps is when we then bring up in a GitOps principle way, pot info deploy, um, and basically do that. Mark, anything to add? Sorry, I was replying to uh, the, one of the questions on chat. I, I missed that. Can you ask it again, David? I oh, know. Um, with Kubeflow and Knative. Um, yes. Oh, I, I was just, yeah, answering that question. We had some questions about, um, you know, can we do all these with, you know, kind of machine learning and stuff? And uh, so, yeah, if anybody else is interested, we have right. some great demos that we've uh, done for bringing GitOps to machine machine learning ops using Flux. Um, and, you know, if it works with Flux, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the design is, should work with Weave GitOps. So if anybody's interested in following up with that, I'd be happy to chat about it. If I'm allowed to do just a bit of advertising, we have a <laughs> product which is called we have GitOps Enterprise. And what we do there, we have we do some certain stuff about what we call profiles and cluster bootstrapping, where we really go into this use cases, which are described there, right? Because um, when, when you have a more complex situation, you want to bring up, you want to define a cluster and a cluster in itself doesn't really come with the stuff you need. For example, the observability, Prometheus, Grafana, or you need your Knative on the cluster to really help to bring up the workloads you want. And you can all this define in a single template and you can define the profiles with the configuration in a single template. And like this, you can, for example, define your, your own platform as a service. You can define your machine learning cluster or your machine learning service. And it when you bootstrap this cluster, it will bring up all the stuff you need in a GitOps way. And it's, it's quite fascinating to watch. You can even delete the whole cluster and it will come up again just by, by applying GitOps to it with everything. But that's for a different story. This is GitOps Enterprise, but I'm sure that Tamo would be very happy to connect you with the right people in our company that can give you a trial of EF GitOps Enterprise. Sorry, I was getting one of those scam phone calls. I had to turn off my phone. <laughs> um, cool. Any other questions or any other ways that we can make sure people are successful before we end? Uh, if not, uh, like I said, Stacy will follow up with an email with our various links, including the links to our Slack channel. And I'm um, happy to help you get to the next steps. And, uh, you know, if this is your first time getting started with Kubernetes or GitOps, hopefully it's a good starter and we're happy to follow up and uh, do anything that will help you be successful. Uh, as I mentioned, Weaveworks as a company, we are committed to making sure that your Kubernetes and GitOps journey is successful. Um, we have these various products, open source and support for any of your needs. So please reach out to us. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, then thank you again to Mark Amice for doing the intro over to Kubernetes and GitOps and Davi for helping us walk through the steps. And of course, as always, Stacy for making sure that these are successful events. So with that, uh, I'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>